Let me introduce you to someone really tremendous who's sitting here beside me. Professor Paula Hammond is the David H. Cole Professor of Engineering at MIT and Head of the Department of Chemical Engineering at MIT. She's a member of the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research and founder of the Institute for Soldier Nanotechnologies. We'll talk about that in a little while. But she began collecting scientific awards about 1990 before she'd even completed her PhD. And she's been collecting them virtually ever since. I think you're a collector yes. now, officially a collector. <laughs> now, your research focuses on the use of electrostatics and other complementary interactions to generate functional materials with highly controlled architecture. That's Is correct. there a simple way of saying this? <laughs> <laughs> I use charge to build things. I love that. See, I like yes. a great science communicator as well. <laughs> Then you arrive at MIT, and what did you find there? How did it feel to walk into a place like that, and why did you choose it? Oh, my goodness, yes. I, I uh, got accepted into MIT and went to visit, and as soon as I got on campus, I thought, I found my people. This <laughs> is it. <laughs> because uh, people were just excited about the science they were doing. There was an excitement about uh, everything from the mechanical end and the electrical end to the chemical end. And uh, you could have these very straightforward, frank discussions about what got you excited about science. And it would be perfectly natural. And uh, you know, in many other venues growing up, this would be the side that you would try to mm. you know, cover up a little bit because it sounds a little geeky. But here, you could celebrate your geek. It was just <laughs> completely 100%. So you got right into the whole nerd thing. Oh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Indulged. Indulged yeah. in it. Absolutely. And I thought, okay, I feel so happy here. Um, MIT is a magical place. You feel, like when you walk down the hallways, like you can reach to your left or right and grab someone, start a conversation, and come up with a new idea. It, it's this, this kind of place where everyone is open to talking about what you can do with, with your science, your engineering, your ideas. Mm. Uh, and that was something I just loved. That's exciting. Now, you were one of only a few women in engineering as an undergraduate, and also one of only a few African Americans and women. So yes. you're a minority of a minority, I've heard you say. Absolutely. But you found a really supportive network of people, didn't you? I did. Uh, when I, in fact, from the very beginning, um, the uh, Afri other African-American students have formed uh, a, a kind of collective. Uh, we had a, a black student union, but we also had this sort of informal way of greeting each other and welcoming each other. And that was something I really needed. Uh, I had come to realize that um, although it's important to sort of engage fully in the outside world, that having these allies uh, yeah. with me, having people who understood uh, where I was coming from, who could relate and talk to me, and we could talk to each other, share each other's uh, pain and misery sometimes <laughs> without any fear, and uh, also encourage each other. Yeah. That was just incredibly important. So this group of students, uh, I continue to be connected with a number of them today. Uh, we, we cheered each other on. We gave each other support. Uh, we let each other know that it's OK, that we did not do as well as we thought on that exam. You know, we need it. I needed that. Now, you had some pretty powerful role models, but you are a very powerful role model to a lot of young people, not just in your lab, but in now in a global community, in this room here today, I think. There's probably a few people that are looking at you going, wow, I want to I wanna be like her. But tell me about who mentors you now. Yes. It's really interesting, but as my career progressed, um, I've always had mentors who were more senior to me and uh, including now, but uh, my colleagues and my peers also became mentors. And it's interesting to note that uh, the people who have gone through similar but different journeys and are along the same path, uh, you can reach out to them and have conversations with them and really compare notes and understand that, ah, oh, you know, there's something else I can do. I, I just came back from a conference uh, where um, there were three of us, uh, Myself and uh, my colleague at University of Pittsburgh and another colleague at Notre Dame who's a dean. And we talked about how we manage life, you know, and I got some tips and I, we gave some tips. It was actually very interesting. Um, so a number of my mentors now are uh, the people who are my close friends. We kind of went through that early struggle together. 
and then we each went off in our different paths, I can learn from them in the paths that they took. They have some very wise things to say. I also have a wonderful mentor in my uh, former department head. He was the one who groomed me. I essentially, I was the executive officer, which is the same as associate department head. In my department, he had asked me to do this role while he was department head. And during that time, he brought me in on difficult conversations, uh, difficult decisions that he was making. He would let me know what he was thinking and we'd bounce it off of each other. And uh, I learned how he handled mm. being a department head. And uh, of course, somewhere around the fourth or fifth year, he started saying things like, how would you like to do this? <laughs> <laughs> and testing he, you out. Testing, <laughs> testing. <laughs> and, but that was, he was an extremely helpful um, senior colleague. And uh, even now as department head, I know that uh, if I'm looking at a sticky situation, I can give him a call and say, you know what? Uh, there's this unusual thing going on, and what's your, what's your thought? And he will immediately respond. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an incredible mm -hmm. uh, person. Did you ever think that you would be in this leadership position in, in you know, those shoes exactly, <laughs> sitting right here? And did, did this ever really enter your mind as a young woman starting out? Definitely not. I, really? I think, you know, I think when I was, uh, Certainly as an undergraduate, if someone had said, oh, you're going to be head of this department, I would have laughed out loud. Really? Yeah. I think that at the time, I was thinking I might want to do research, but I was still finding my place. Uh, then later on, when I became a, a professor, I, 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 I came to know that I wanted to be a professor after working at Motorola and moving back to a campus, the, the lights turned on and I thought, you know, I really love this ability to mm -hmm. shape my own path with my research ideas. And as long as I can get someone to give me money to do it, then I can, I can do it. So that was really the fun part of being a professor. But as I became a professor, I, I had this tendency, and maybe we all have a, a shade of this, to think, oh, not me, right? Uh, so I actually didn't apply to MIT as a faculty member. I was asked. So I was applying everywhere else. and. Um, the department head approached me at a meeting and said, uh, I hear you're applying to lots of places uh, uh, as you look for a faculty position. I said, oh, yes, and I gave him this list. He said, so why aren't you applying to MIT? And I couldn't really give him a good answer. <laughs> and he went, oh, yeah. yeah. I, was, I was getting around to that. Getting around yeah. to that. Yeah. So he said, oh, I hope that I get to see your application. So I sent it in. When I got into MIT, um, my colleagues joked about my being department head one day, and I thought, you guys are, you know, dreaming. Taking a, dreaming. You're Tell taking them they're dreaming. Device. That's an Australian saying. Is that right? Tell them they're dreaming. Tell yeah. them they're dreaming. Yeah, exactly. Them they're dreaming. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, a very famous saying. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. But you're, you're here now, and I want to ask you this. Would you consider yourself an ambitious woman? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I am absolutely ambitious. I have always wanted to see uh, my ideas come to fruition. The only way to do that is to bring them forward, uh, to be determined, to be forthright. Uh, and to me, ambitious is what we all are if we acknowledge what we want, what we want to make real. Mm -hmm. And for me, I have always wanted to make um, the kinds of uh, research ideas that we talk about in our lab real. I've wanted to move them forward. Um, and when it comes to my leadership uh, in the department, I think of that as a, an incredibly important mantle. Mm. And part of the reason I think that I was selected to be the department head is because I am competitive. I, I, I want to win. I want us yep. to be the most excellent place we can possibly be. And to me, there's nothing, nothing higher than that. Uh, so ambitious, ambition is a wonderful thing. It, it makes all of us better. And it, and it actually pushes all of us further. Um, mm. Why don't we use this language as women? I know. I, 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 I really regret the fact that as women, we'll often use ambitious in an aside that is meant to uh, really imply that this is somebody who is ruthless and uh, uh, has some sort of unguided um, uh, effort underway to uh, take over. Ambitious for women, for some reason, has taken on this negative form when it shouldn't. And you think about all of those uh, wonderful, especially these older movies, where they say, 
what an ambitious young man. You know, it's such mm -hmm. a wonderful thing. You think this is somebody who has promise. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same for young women. Ambitious young women have promise. They have things to offer. They're determined. They, they have a thought in their head that they want to make real. Mm -hmm. and, and that is exactly what we need. We need ambitious young women. We need to embrace the word and make it the positive thing that it is. Mm -hmm. Quite agree. Tell me about not getting what you want. Ah, yes. <laughs> now, surely, surely there's been a few things, Paula, that you just haven't got what you wanted or when you wanted it. Yes. How do you cope with failure, yes. if you call it failure, and then how do you pick yourself up and dust yourself off? Because sometimes things don't work out, particularly yes. in STEM. Yes, yes. You're absolutely right. In this case, uh, I really, really rely on the people who love me most because... Uh, when I'm first experiencing failure and not getting something that I really counted on, I, I need to have a moment to fold in a little bit. Mm. Um, you know, some of us would say curl into a little fetal position just for a moment. Go into your cave. Go into yeah. your cave. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, uh, my, my husband unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, but he was always that person. Uh, now I, I use my, uh, my peer mentors and we regale each other, you know, I, I say, oh, my God, I didn't get that grant. Or, oh, God, you know, the, the nomination went forward, but it didn't, it didn't go all the way. Mm -hmm. And they, I, we will tell each other, you know, you're fantastic. What you're doing is incredible. And you need to keep moving on. Mm -hmm. You need to get back up and do it because, you know, what you're doing needs to be done and you're the one. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we do that to each other, we actually help by allowing fa the failure to exist, you know, failure exists for all of us and we're all okay, uh, but also by letting us ourselves know mm -hmm. that we need to continue our mission and that this one little thing isn't going to keep us away. And that one little thing is just a little thing. Yeah. The big picture is always still there. Yeah, yeah. I think it's important that we have this conversation, particularly as I see young women choosing STEM careers from school, and they're often very high-performing students. Yes. And then they get to a point where they don't get what they want. They're not used to it. It's very how, true. How, as, as women in STEM, how can we help our younger female colleagues particularly cope with suddenly not... You found this when you went yes. from your... Fabulous, you know, junior high school into MRT. You are not the top of the grade. That is very true. And this sorry is sorry to remind <laughs> you of that. <laughs> oh no, no, I You're mentioned still a big two success. standard D's below <laughs> the average in my first <laughs> exams. I seriously, when when um, I went from being the high school sweetheart, the valedictorian, all of this, top of the class, and then you go to a place like MIT where everybody was the valedictorian. Hmm. And, uh, you know, oh my gosh, somebody has to be in the middle of the curve and not at the top. So uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that you remain excellent. One of the things that I did when I was um, uh, in college was compete with myself and only myself. And that was ultimately extremely rewarding and also more realistic. Hmm. So when I, once I realized, okay, it's a different setting here, and I'm surrounded by people who are just outstanding, and that's wonderful, but I belong to that set. Mm -hmm. we're, simply, we're simply going through our, our rounds of education at different times. I would tell myself, okay, one day I'm going to be doing wonderful things, so I need this knowledge. I need it one way or the other, so I'm going to stick through it. Um, but what I'm going to do is measure how well I did relative to how well I did last week. Yeah. And then as I, as I move forward, did I learn something? Did I learn a little bit more? This, uh, when I, my first, uh, my thermodynamics class, chemical engineering thermodynamics has all kinds of words that did not exist in high school. Um, you know, fugacity, oh God, you know, uh, that's just the beginning. And so I'm thinking, wow, these are some concepts that weren't introduced to me before. Mm -hmm. So of course, it's going to take me a while. So let me just simply measure if I understand it better uh, two weeks from now, four weeks from now. And that actually helped me get through um, these really difficult courses 
without feeling as, as tired and as difficult. If you, if you, however, make it your goal to compete against the person on your left and right, mm. that's not healthy. It's your, that's not really your yardstick, is it? And I think um, we have to remember that it's our internal yardstick. We know that we're on a road to success mm. and we simply want to make sure we're making that progress. If you keep that in mind, then your eyes stay on the goal mm -hmm. and your eyes stay on self-improvement and uh, you don't mull over um, how so-and-so did and how they, mm -hmm. these other people do. What I have found over time is that um, in my life, I have been able to achieve those things. I am very happy for my colleagues who achieve the things that they do, but I've been able to move toward the things that I want. Yeah. Please introduce yourself to the Institute. Institute. <laughs> yeah, from. Um, hello, I'm Misty Jenkins and I run a lab here in Melbourne and um, I'm an immunologist. I um, also have a mum who's Gundijamara, um, uh, First Nations Australian, and so I have an interest in Indigenous STEM. And I, I, I talked, I meet a lot of young Aboriginal scientists, budding scientists of colour. And there's a lot of pressure from them and their communities and their families to work on things that are Aboriginal. And so my question is, um, you know, and I'm always asked to sort of help them navigate that space and that it's okay to, to be a scientist and to be Aboriginal and, and work in a Western, West, within yes. Western ways of thinking. So I guess I was interested to hear from you in your journey around this idea of being a woman in colour, uh, of colour. Um, thank you so much for your beautiful words today. They're really inspiring. Um, what advice would you give to young Indigenous scientists to be? <laughs> I would definitely, that's, that's a wonderful question. I would definitely say that your voice is so incredibly important. So to a young uh, Aboriginal scientist who's trying to make some decisions about whether to delve deeper into uh, sort of the, the Western science venue uh, versus focusing on cultural aspects, uh, they're, 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 as long as there are people who are working on those cultural aspects, we also need people who will represent that Aboriginal voice in Western science. Mm -hmm. We need everybody at the table, because if we don't have everybody at the table, then the developments, uh, the scientific uh, insights that we gain from that particular perspective are lost. Mm -hmm. And one thing I have learned in running my own research lab is that we are always better when we have many different voices at the table. Diversity leads to excellence. Not only that, but it's important that uh, that perspective be present so that technologies benefit all people. I think that it is very easy uh, for developments to um, favor one culture or one race or one, one group of people and, and for scientists to not even be conscious of it. Mm -hmm. If you're not at the table, you're not able to help shape that science and bring it to where it needs to be to help all of us. A really great example is uh, with uh, the use of machine learning in uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. And some of you may have heard some of the stories. Some of the early programs uh, could recognize, uh, couldn't recognize people of color as well as they could people um, uh, who were white. And the problem is that you know, the, the vehicle is trying to make a calculation about whether a person is in front of me. <laughs> you want to make sure that that data is included. Well, what, the real, what was really happening was that the uh, scientists were using themselves as subjects to feed data. Yeah. And they all looked the same. So it, it, it didn't occur and it was not, you know, was it meant to be a mean and exclusion, but simply did not have any subjects of color that were used in the, in the models and didn't come up, didn't Thank think you. of it. Excellent. So we've talked a lot about getting people into the pipeline and I was just wanting to hear a bit from you on how you keep people in that pipeline. Oh, yes. So we know that women drop out at certain points and they don't come back in um, or they go into more diverse environments. Um, if you could comment on how that's being tackled at MIT and in the wider community. Uh, that's an excellent question. It's a very real problem. We see it uh, when we see the drop-off between those who are getting their undergraduate degrees and those who uh, enter the graduate program. We see this dramatic drop, uh, for example. And then the same thing happens as we move into faculty. Uh, I think, uh, and even in, in amongst our undergraduate, uh, those who matriculate in the undergraduate programs, 
One of the things that uh, I think we're all learning is that culture is, in, is incredibly important uh, and that uh, having an environment in which a person feels self safe and uh, welcomed and enabled is, is extremely key. Uh, in our own department, we're already having some of these conversations because uh, we uh, recognize that students often think that faculty are perhaps not necessarily with them. <laughs> uh, we're trying to make it clear that faculty want their success in every way. I think when we introduce environments that are more welcoming, that uh, in, fit, allow students to feel that they can express themselves, that uh, we're more likely to retain women because uh, quite frankly, we, life is hard enough for us. <laughs> and the last thing that we want is, is to enter another hostile environment. And uh, I think that's one of the key things uh, at MIT that we're trying to focus on. Of course, there are other factors as well. I think uh, making resources available to help students, I think having transparent processes, all of these things are enabling uh, for women. Uh, and uh, it, they also tend to diminish uh, environments in which there's kind of like the guy's attitude which leaves the girls out. Uh, and, and creates an, uh, an environment in which everybody's voice, male and female, are highly respected because it, it, it causes us to be more reflective in the way that we behave. Mm. Mm. That culture of respect, you know, that's really where it begins, doesn't it? It Our really language, does. Our language, the way we engage with each other. Absolutely. Mm. With that sense of respect, you stay. Mm. If if there is, if you don't get that sense that you're going to be respected, you start looking for you're the not door. Valued. Exactly, mm. Mm. exactly. No, that's true. Maggie. Hi, I'm Marguerite Evans Gallier. I'm the executive director of Industry Mentoring Network in STEM and co-founder of Women in STEM Australia. Thank you very much for your words today. You've inspired everyone in this room. I'm interested to know um, in speaking about the culture of STEM because it can be more challenging in some disciplines than others. Um, what is the role of men and, and male leaders in this, in this, in this conversation? Uh, men can do a huge amount uh, to address this culture of STEM. In fact, uh, that some of my best mentors uh, have been uh, men, including the professors that I worked with as a graduate student who made me feel at home and also encouraged me to do more and to go further. And it's just that touch, just the simple words that can make a huge difference. One example is that my thesis advisor, uh, was uh, Michael Rubner was uh, someone who at MIT was a hot, you know, hot shot, very well known in his field and going up for tenure. And yet um, he made a point of saying, uh, you know, I'm going to leave at 4.30 because I have a life. I want to see my wife and my, my dogs in my, in my mm. yard and uh, I'll see you in the morning. Uh, that gave permission for me as a graduate student to say, well, you know what? Um, I'm planning a family, I have a life. I, have, I can put parameters around my time so that there is time for the rest of life. Uh, so having a man do that is, was incredibly enabling. And another example that in, made me feel enabled was a similar one in which at a faculty meeting when I was a junior faculty member, uh, one of my very senior colleagues got up and said, uh, well, you know, I have to pick up uh, my son and it's time for the baseball game. So I'm going to have to leave um, at XYZ time. And, and, you know, a couple of us women then said, you know, <laughs> we have to pick up our kids too. And you, you, you kind of feel, you know, a little guilty. But he just eliminated all of the guilt. He, mm -hmm. he made it clear that men can care about these things too. As soon as men begin putting in a voice for family life, for um, uh, professional development, uh, alongside uh, personal development, then it, it, it allows us to acknowledge the wholeness of ourselves, and, and that yeah. makes it a lot easier in the to workplace. To be ourselves. Exactly, to be ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go, there's another one. My name's Linda McIver. I'm Executive Director of the Australian Data Science Education Institute. I am 46, and it has taken me until this year to have faith in my um, my experience, my expertise and my abilities and to branch out and do something which I really believe in. Um, I've taught 15 year olds who have 
more confidence than I had until recently. <laughs> and it's partly because of the Superstars of STEM program that I've got the confidence to do this. My question is very related to the last one, but it's collective. How can we collectively inspire and encourage our young people to have faith in themselves earlier, to do what you said before, which is not listen to the voice that says you can't do this and see something you want and believe in and just go for it. Collectively, how do we do that? That's an excellent question. I think we need to talk much more openly about failure being a part of success. Mm. I think we have to talk much more openly about the fact that uh, we all, all of us, feel like imposters sometimes. Yep. You know, I think we have to talk about the fact that uh, those little voices of doubt are, are things that you need to, you know, set aside. Uh, because everyone experiences them, but they are not helpful. And, and I, I, the more that we have these open conversations about that, and we talk to our children, even as they're growing up, as they're, as they're evolving, you know, you may feel like you can't do it, but I know that you can do what you need to do. You know, and uh, encouraging students to take different approaches, to try different routes, to get where they need to go, so that they know there's not just one way mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. successful. Mm -hmm. I think we need to do more of that, and, and that's, that, that hopefully would be a start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm a year 12 student at MLC, and it's such a privilege to be the Young Women Ambassador for the Grant Clark Creation. So Paula, it was incredibly inspiring to hear from you, and also, really important for me at least that you acknowledge the influence of your parents and also your teachers. So coming from um, leading a student organisation where we have students from all around Victoria and I see a lot of students who are motivated or interested in STEM but they don't necessarily have those support networks that can help them develop that passion. They don't have the parents, they don't have the teachers, they simply don't have the resources and the access. How do you propose that we can reach out to these students who do need a lot of our support in helping them reach their fullest potential? Oh, that's excellent. Uh, I really think that uh, that was an excellent question. <laughs> I really think that uh, we, we are all responsible for making sure that young people know that these career paths are available to them. And uh, we each may have a different way of reaching people, but uh, if we can get more uh, women scientists into classrooms or into events where a student can see mm. that this is possible, we start to make a difference. Sometimes it's simply the knowledge that that can exist. Uh, I think we also need to continue to encourage our media to portray us mm. more frequently uh, we should hear more stories on the radio about women scientists. We should have more conversations on TV about women scientists. One of the things that I, I, I would predict, some of you may know the uh, going to the movie industry, uh, that um, uh, the Black Panther movie it, it got, it, it induced so much excitement was that there was a, a technologist, this young uh, mm. uh, woman of color technologist who was a super geek and loved it and had her lab, that there will be lots of young girls saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a lab, you know, yeah. I'm gonna make, you know, I don't know, tennis shoes that make you fly or whatever. You, we need to allow them to imagine in those realms and we don't, uh, we don't do that well enough. We have to do it more frequently. We need to do it across uh, all of the uh, different uh, cultural groups. We need to be able to portray the excellence that we get when we bring people of diverse groups together and we need to show that science makes a difference and this is an opportunity for you to make a difference and that you're capable of doing it. And you're pro problem solving. And you're problem solving. It's something that is, is actually inherent that we solve problems every day, science is another way of doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we need to make science more accessible uh, so that students know that this doesn't require, you know, super brain, it requires the ability to apply your thought and, and, and uh, to be creative. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Got a question over here. Come on. Hi. Um, my name's Samantha and I'm also a Year 12 student. Um, I'm in my final year at the McRobertson Girls High School, which is um, the only select entry academic school for girls in Victoria. And um, because of the selective nature of the school, 
um, the girls at my school are actually very high achieving and they're ambitious and a lot of them do want to pursue STEM um, in their careers. Um, I suppose my question is, you know, like being in a society where girls are often pitted against each other, especially in their careers and when they're choosing their career paths. Um, my school is a very supportive environment, but I'm worried that once we leave, people yeah. will st start to feel that sort of pressure to compete against each other. So how do we support each other as students and as girls and women growing up and going into the industry? Now, I, I think it's incredibly important. Uh, I think one of the things I was hearing about today was uh, Twitter feed in which uh, women in STEM communicate with each other and I think prod each other on. I think we need to uh, think of ourselves as uh, this uh, very special group, a club of people when we're, we're really rooting each other towards success and that the success of, of one of us equals the success of all of us. When we think of it from this sort of family perspective, uh, we become more supportive of each other. We think of ways we can help each other and we create networks and those networks will help us all later on. Uh, we'll find out that our friend uh, in high school is actually the one who owns the venture fund that can fund our idea. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to know her. Yeah, yeah. we want to know her. <laughs> or, or the person who will, um, whose science will actually make the real difference in making a, um, an idea translational. Uh, so the idea that uh, your current classmates could be your future partners, could mm -hmm. be your future um, enablers, I think those ideas are the ones that keep you going and allow you to think, let me help and let me create a community that is going to um, lead to the success of many, many women. It's not, there's no limit on how many successful women we can have. And that's, that's, that it's is never the key. too many. There are never <laughs> too many and it's never a limit. I want to acknowledge the wonderful sponsors that put together and help us to bring these sort of events to you. Thank you very much at Convergence Science Network to Luan Ismahil. Thank you very much to all of you because for you being here today is a really clear message to our community that women in STEM really matter, that we've got a great story to tell, that we're a network of women that are not just supporting other women but supporting scientific excellence. And that is really at the heart of why women in STEM will succeed and are succeeding right now. Thank the people around you for making the time to come here today. Thank you, Paula. Thank I you. appreciate your company. I'm so looking forward to the oration tonight. I might give you five minutes to have some quiet time and prepare. <laughs> <laughs>